panel on the side as well? Uh, I have the panel on my end, but I can see the full, full slide. Okay, you can see the full slide? Okay, I'm not blocking the slide with any of the, the stuff. Nope, I can see the full thing. Great. Awesome, so we can go ahead, we can go get ahead and get started. Um, so I wanna introduce myself. My name is Amy. Um, I work for Boston Scientific and we support both the spinal cord stimulation and the vertiflex procedures for Dr. Gutierrez. Um, Dr. Gutierrez practices at PSA in Austin and he covers the Austin area along with the Round Rock area as well. So you'll be hearing about both spinal cord stimulation and vertiflex in today's call and we will have a Q&A at the end. So there's a question area on the bottom of your screen if you want to put questions in and we will get to that at the end of the call. Try to keep them HIPAA compliant. And if you have a detailed question, you can follow up with him in clinic on that one. So I will go ahead and pass it over to you, Dr. Gutierrez. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, so we're gonna discuss a few things tonight. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for taking the time, obviously to um, take time of their home life and uh, right around dinner time uh, to spend a few moments with, with us and uh, to hear um, a message from me um, about some very exciting therapies that I'm very passionate about. And uh, clearly um, you're interested um, if you're here. So um, I wanna just fully disclose that um, if you are interested and you feel like this is um, a good therapy for you, um, I really, please encourage, I encourage you to um, set up a consultation with me. Um, or with any of my partners uh, to discuss uh, if this is the right thing for you. Um, the therapies we're gonna talk about tonight um, work very, very, very well, um, but they don't work for everybody. Um, so we have to really make sure that you're, you're a candidate and make sure you fit the right criteria, both from uh, a diagnostic standpoint, as well as make sure there's no contraindications that would set you up for um, not having as good of an outcome as you possibly can um, with any of these therapies we're gonna talk about tonight. So um, we'll talk about those options um, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see if any questions come up uh, at the end. And please, yeah, I encourage you to type in your question on that little question bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we're gonna talk about different kinds of pain right now. Um, there's two different kinds of pain and without getting too lost in the weeds here, um, there's pain that's due to a malfunctioning joint or mechanical problem in your body. There's also pain due to nerve damage or um, a reactive nerve uh, pain syndrome, uh, which is gonna cause a diff very different kind of pain. Uh, pain that's uh, due to a nerve damage or, or to some sort of, uh, we call this a neuropathic process, um, can happen from a trigger or without a trigger. Um, it can typically be manifested as a burning sensation or pins and needles. Some, a lot of times numbness is accompanied by uh, nerve pain. A lot of my patients describe it as shooting, burning, um, feel like they're walking on hot coals. Um, I've had patients tell me it feels like they're getting branded with like a hot iron or something. Um, and a lot of times there's weakness associated with that as well, which is an important thing to, to report to your doctor or to me uh, um, if you're experiencing new weakness, specifically in a certain muscle or if you start seeing a muscle um, changing in, in, uh, in size um, without any, any, any other potential trigger. So um, what we'll, in mechanical pain before I keep going further is more to me pain that has a known trigger with a certain activity. Um, and the biggest thing I tell all my patients I may have told you already is, is there any position that you can get into where you can get out of pain by laying on your back, laying on your stomach, laying on your side, sitting in a lazy boy, um, sitting in a, on a hard chair. I mean, is there anything that you can do to get completely out of pain? Because if so, it's more likely to have mechanical pain as opposed to neuropathic pain, which my patients really have a hard time uh, getting, finding any comfortable position, no matter what position they're in, no matter what they're doing, it's still there and it still radiates in a very specific pattern like down the leg or down an arm into the hand and something like that. Um, so in general, in this, for this slide, everybody knows this if you're one of my patients, it can really impact your life. It can really impact a lot of the activities um, you enjoy doing and uh, playing with your grandchildren. Uh, it can interfere with your ability to work um, and get, or get through a work day comfortably. 
can inhibit um, other activities like walking, gardening. Um, also, sexual activity can be very, very difficult um, if you're in a chronic pain state. Um, you may have already tried some of the uh, common, common avenues for anybody in pain, which starts with over-the-counter medications, Tylenol, Advil, Aleve. Maybe you've gone to physical therapy or seen a chiropractor. Um, maybe you've already even started using a little bit of like a TENS unit, which is like an electrical um, transcutaneous stimulation modality where you plug um, those little wires into patches on, on your skin and put it over the painful area. Um, maybe you've tried opioid medications. Maybe you've tried nerve blocks um, with a different pain management doctor or myself. Maybe you've already had back surgery um, or knee surgery, uh, ankle surgery, and you still have uh, severe pain in that joint or in that region. Or maybe you have new pain that developed after that surgery in that region. A lot of times neuropathic pain can occur due to uh, the surgical process and dissecting down through the soft tissue, you, you can damage nerves. And a lot of times you get irritated nerves after, after surgery and we have options uh, for that kind of pain. Um, we're gonna talk about three specific treatments tonight. One is radiofrequency ablation. The other is uh, indirect decompression, um, which is for spinal stenosis. And the last one is spinal cord stimulation. Uh, we'll talk about the, um, probably the least uh, permanent one of the three, and that's radiofrequency ablation for pain management. Uh, this is a minimally invasive procedure done through a needle. Uh, can be done either at an outpatient surgical center or just in my office and it's intended to treat mechanical pain, um, typically arthritis. So a lot of my patients um, with back pain, hip pain, knee pain, neck pain, can get a lot of relief from this treatment. Uh, this is a procedure in which what we're doing is creating a lesion or damage to a nerve. Now you may already think, why would we wanna damage a nerve? I thought that was bad. Well, it certainly can be, um, but in this circumstance, we're targeting very specific sensory nerves that go to a very specific joint in the body. And the idea is if you have a painful joint, may it be your hip, your knee, or a small little joint in your back or your neck, if you can target the nerves that go to that joint, the sensory nerves, um, you can also create a uh, blockage of that nerve by burning it um, or I should say of heating it up. Um, and when we heat these nerves up, it changes the protein composition of that nerve. And I like to describe it like hard boiling an egg. Uh, you heat it up and the proteins in that egg change and that egg is now very different. Um, the nerve goes to the same process and no longer is it able to really communicate sensation from that joint. So let's say you have hip arthritis or knee arthritis you have a swollen, achy joint with arthritis, and you, we know that, and you know that, but your brain doesn't need to keep being told that it's swollen and achy and arthritic 24 seven or anytime you're trying to do some gardening or some walking. Um, you can still, and a question that comes up a lot with this procedure is, will I still be able to feel pain if I break my knee or if I burn my knee? Uh, yes, you will. Um, we're only gonna be targeting small sensory nerves you'll still be able to have breakthrough pain um, if something traumatic were to happen. Um, it's not gonna completely numb you, up your knee or your body to pain indefinitely. It will only uh, target the small nerves that communicate that chronic, dull, achy pain that you're sick of having every day that you, you don't have to live with. Um, it's important to mention this procedure is not permanent. It is durable. It'll certainly last you at least six months um, national averages show that this typically lasts 10 to 14 months. Um, and my patients typically last, uh, it, it fall between that, that, that range with about a year of relief. Uh, most of my patients, some of my patients um, will have less uh, duration of relief. And that has to do with how fast your nerve regenerates, how fast your nerve heals and goes back to that normal state of functioning. And that can be six months in some people. It could be two years in other people. I, I have a patient that I do this on every two years in her back because that's how long it lasts for her. Um, so eventually the nerve will go back to its normal state. And at that point, 
the pain usually does come back, although sometimes not as severe because there is some evidence, or some body of evidence or proof that uh, the new nerve that grows back or redevelops there isn't as good as the original nerve that was there to begin with. Let's talk about vertiflex. This is the uh, interspinous decompression that we mentioned as the second bullet point on our uh, previous slide. This is a treatment for spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis is um, a condition in which we have low back pain and sometimes shooting pain down the legs. You can see the little lightning bolt on um, the little people here on the left. Sometimes it's not shooting, radiating, lightning bolt type pain. A lot of my patients will say that they feel like their legs are getting heavy the more they walk, the more they stand. They feel like their legs are going numb. They'll feel like their legs are just kind of like getting achy and crampy, kind of like almost like Charlie horses, but not quite as, as, as severe of a cramp as a Charlie horse. Um, but in general, they get a lot of this leg tiredness when they're up and walking. But invariably, as soon as they sit down, it starts feeling better. Um, a lot of my patients will take breaks when they're at the grocery store. They'll sit down for a little bit and finish up their shopping. Or if they're walking around the block with their family, a lot of us are going on walks these days, uh, they need to sit down for a little bit and take a break to give their legs and their back a little bit of a breather before they keep going. A lot of my patients will also say that when they bend forward a little bit, seems to help their back and their legs a lot. Um, the grocery cart has been draw, uh, drawn in here on the people on the right. And um, when I'm talking to my patients, we call this a stop and shop. When, you, when you're in a stop and shop is a, a line of grocery stores in the Northeast and in Boston, I don't know, know if people know what stop and shop is here. But uh, what, what this, what this is um, like is if you're at HEB, um, we can start calling it the HEB. <laughs> But if you lean forward on your, um, on your grocery cart and you finish the day, you, fin you finish your, your outing at Home Depot or at HEB, leaning forward on the cart like that, because it makes your back and legs feel a whole lot better, chances are you likely have spinal stenosis, which can be confirmed on an MRI um, and on a clinical exam with me. But what it is, is it's narrowing in the middle or the, the barrel of the spine where your neural elements and your spinal cord, your spinal nerves and fluid all live, that barrel becomes squished or triangulated or narrow. All of a sudden you start developing all these symptoms, but when you bend forward, it opens it back up a little bit. It relieves a lot of the pressure that's developed in, in that barrel of the spine. And that's why sitting down seems to do such a good job in reducing your pain is because when you sit down, you are leaning forward, whether you realize it or not, you are flexing or leaning forward with your spine. And when you're on the grocery cart or with a cane or with a rolling walker, you're doing the same thing. Um, you can see here in the two different uh, photographs um, on this slide, there's the healthy spine and the stenotic spine. You can see the red angry uh, nerves and spinal canal depicted here. And uh, that can also pinch the nerves as they exit the spine. So the idea with this uh, inner spinous spacer is to distract or open up that area a little bit by fitting in between your bones and holding it open for you the same way you do naturally when you're sitting or hunching forward while you're walking. Uh, there's no bone removed, there is nothing permanent like screws or nuts or bolts or brackets put in um, like traditional spinal surgery. This is a minimally invasive procedure done through an incision just about the size of a, a hole for like a, the key to your front door. I make incisions about this big, about one centimeter in order to put a tube, resembles a straw, down in between the bones to deploy this little unit that holds the the spine apart and acts like a brace at that level. Uh, we place this typically at one or two levels, depending on um, how many bad levels you may have. Uh, but it's a very speedy recovery. Most of my patients say they're sore for about a day, literally 24, 48 hours. And we'll hear from some patients here at the end that have had this. Um, and after 24, 48 hours, 
after that soreness goes away, they're already walking a little bit better. They're already having less leg pain, leg tiredness, leg numbness when they're up and walking. Um, I forgot to mention, you go home the same day, you're not admitted to the hospital, you're not gonna be at St. David's or at Seton for a day or two, you get to go home right away. Uh, you'll have a little Band-Aid you remove after 48 hours and you will not be on any long-term antibiotics. Um, I usually do send a, a home health nurse out to your house to check on your incision and to also do a little bit of PT already because you can start participating in some walking and some, some uh, physical therapy type activities right away. Um, here we have some stats on this uh, VertiFlex procedure. Um, we have two patients here giving their testimonial, but nine out of 10 patients, about 90% of our patients will have relief. And this is from the national database and it's my, my data here at my own practice mirrors these numbers as well. I've had patients come completely off of opioids if they're on them to begin with. Um, and I've had a lot of patients report less disability, ability to walk farther and longer. Um, and the majority of my patients, 75%, uh, just like our national numbers here, I'd say it's about in the same, in the same ballpark, have just a huge reduction in leg pain, uh, which is very important to them as the, a lot of the reason we went forward with this is because their legs just give out or feel like they're just getting too tired when they walk and this makes all the difference for them. Uh, I'm gonna get on to the very last uh, treatment we're gonna uh, talk about today, which is spinal cord stimulation. Uh, this is um, a therapy that's been around since the 70s, but has gone through several upgrades in even the, just the last 10 years. And the devices have become, all therapy I should say, has become a lot more sophisticated, a lot more elegant, and a lot more tailored to the patient's needs and their specific pain diagnosis and syndrome. First, we should start with who would benefit from this. And this goes back to my talk about neuropathic pain. This is pain that is present no matter what you're doing. You cannot get comfortable sitting you cannot get comfortable laying down. No matter what you're doing, that pain is still in your back, it's still in your legs, it's still in your foot, it's still in your hand or arm, it's still in your neck. No matter what you do, it's still there. Chances are it's very likely neuropathic, especially if it fits the other features that we talked about earlier. Um, you'll see some diagnoses here as um, common sources of neuropathic pain that will respond to spinal cord stimulation. Uh, one of them is called failed back surgery syndrome, and that just has its name because it means that the back surgery failed to provide you with long-term meaningful pain relief. doesn't mean your back surgery necessarily failed. Your back surgery may still be very, very much stable and doing a good job in keep, at keeping your, your back in a stable position, but you still may have pain in your back or down your legs that may be due to pre-existing nerve damage before your spine surgery or some scar tissue that may have developed in your spine as a consequence of the spine surgery, and now you're having neuropathic pain due to nerve irritation in your spine. Another uh, common reason to put this in is neuropathic pain in the feet or in the legs. Uh, CRPS, RSD is one that's a reactive neuropathy, um, typically to nerve damage that occurs from trauma. May it be a car accident or surgery. Um, in which a nerve was damaged or transected or cut during the surgery, which has now caused a reactive nerve pain state where that, that leg or that knee or that foot's constantly firing, or the nerves are constantly firing, and it feels constantly like your, 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 your leg or your limb is on fire, hot, or like you have a million pins and needles in that area. Um, that, that, that's, again, so the, one of the most common ways to describe that kind of pain. Um, you know, also patients that have had less invasive, like the radiofrequency ablation, maybe numerous epidural steroid injections, which maybe many of you guys have already had, um, maybe numerous joint injections. Um, if you've failed all other least invasive options, this may be a good treatment for you. Now, like I said earlier, this works on a lot of my patients. It works on a lot of my patients when we move forward with this therapy, but it doesn't work for everybody. So the good thing about this therapy, which is one of my favorite things about it, is you get to do a trial. Um, I just did a few trials today here at the surgery center, 
And what the trial is, it's basically a test drive. You get to see if it works for you before you commit to having the actual surgery for it. It's the only surgery I know of where you can try it before you commit to it. You get to actually see what it's going to do for you before you buy in or commit to it. Um, with any other traditional spine surgery and any of the other therapies we talked about tonight, you do not get to see what it's going to do for you before you end up having the surgery. You only get to find out after the fact. So this is very different in that regard. Um, yes, another slide here. I may have covered some of the stuff already. It's been around since the seventies. It is FDA approved. It is non-drug, non-opioid therapy. It's covered by most major medical insurance, including workman's comp including Medicare, including TRICARE, including Medicaid. Um, how it works. A lot, I get a lot of this, these questions um, in the clinic and it's complex. There's a lot of theories as to how it works because we're, what we're finding out as we study this more and more in the lab and overseas and as this technology is getting more and more sophisticated is that it works probably more ways than just one. In the past, when this thing first came out, we thought that it was just kind of closing the gate on the pain signal up to the brain. By stimulating the nerves, we were able to shut that nerve off or shut it down and make it non-functional. Turns out we're actually not doing that, that exactly, but we're actually changing the way the actual neurons behave. The neurons are the cells in your spinal cord and in your nerve that travel up to your brain. And there's even evidence that it reorganizes the way your brain processes pain and it changes in, a, in, a, in, in the shape of, or in a form of plasticity is what we call it, the way the pain centers are arranged in your brain and how it's processed. Uh, for an, another nice, um, nice uh, analogy here is the noise canceling headphones analogy. It does filter out chronic over firing nerves that, have been firing 24 seven for maybe years, but it will not shut down acute normal functioning nerves like light touch and sensation. You'll still be able to feel someone pat you on the back or touch you. Um, and you will importantly also be able to feel if, if you have a, something sharp um, touch, your, touch your back or your, or your leg, um, or you bump it into the coffee table, you'll still be able to feel that. And I don't know if anybody here has put on the Bose noise canceling headphones, but it doesn't cancel all noise. It cancels that constant drone that you hear like on the airplane, or if you're on an, in a noisy environment where it's, there's a constant pitch, it will provide, it'll calculate that waveform that's coming in and provide a counter waveform going the other way to cancel it out. This kind of works the same way in that it's gonna filter out that chronic dull aching pain maybe that burning pain in your foot, leg, and ankle, and traveling all the way up the back of your leg into your spine, but it will not impede or stop, you know, if you step into a fire, a campfire or something, it will not impede your ability to feel that. It's because it's important for your body to feel that so it doesn't hurt, so you don't hurt yourself. Um, sorry, let me move my thing here. It's blocking the entire slide here. Um, but how do you know if, if uh, the SES trial worked for you? We define um, success in a trial um, with, as 50% reduction in pain. Now, a lot of my patients get a lot more than that. And especially now in the more new age era of spinal cord stimulation and neuromodulation, we're getting patients getting 75, 80, 90, 100% relief. It's incredible because even when I trained in fellowship, when I was first learning how to do this procedure in the surgery, I mean, if we got 50%, that was great. If we got 30% improvement, that was still meaningful enough to some people that they would want to move forward with it because 30% of severe pain is still 30%. But nowadays, and I, and I can't believe it sometimes when I hear um, patients come back and say they have no pain, 100% relief, and they've taken themselves completely off of pain medications. Um, in the last year or two, Boston Scientific's come out with a very, very elegant platform that allows patients to use two or three different functions of the spinal cord stimulation that may have two or three different mechanisms of how it provides relief. And all of those modalities combined will help step down the pain even further. 
So there's even been a study within the last year that showed that the combination therapy that um, Boston Scientific has reduced pain scores over monotherapy or just using a single waveform with patients getting further reduction in pain when they add in that second wave or that second modality of, of uh, relief or, or of uh, programming as we call it. And Boston Scientific is the only system of like the five or six that are out there that can run multiple waveforms or multiple modes at the same time. Um, it, we talked about these, kind of touched on these three modes earlier, but the paresthesia mode, which basically means there's a soothing vibration covering where you have your pain. If your pain is in your back, a paresthesia based mode is one in which you feel smooth vibrations. We call it the good vibrations sometimes when we're testing it out on the table. Uh, and if it's covering the areas of your low back where you hurt, that provides the most basic form of relief, but it's the most instant form of relief that this can provide. There's the paresthesia free modes, which are on a different frequency. If you think about what the human ear can hear, can only hear within a certain range. Dogs can hear a dog whistle. It's in a much higher frequency than humans. Paresthesia free is a higher frequency of a waveform that comes out of this out of this device, and your body is not able to feel it, and it's not able to translate into a smooth a smooth vibration or a soothing buzz that you feel and it covers up your pain. This is one that will actually change the behavior of your nerves and inhibit them from transmitting pain, but it doesn't work as instantly as the other first mode we talked about. This mode takes usually 24 hours to wash in, and even if you've turned it off, it takes about 24 hours to wash out, but it's on a frequency that your body does not perceive. So a lot of times people have very complex pain distributions, and it's very hard to recreate the vibration exactly over those two or three sometimes four areas. So we can have a paresthesia mode to cover like the, the low back, but we can have the paresthesia mode for all the other areas that we cannot superimpose or cover up specifically with that vibration. And we can also, like I said, combine them to be running both at the same time and you can get the most out of the device. Here's a study I was talking about earlier um, where we showed two years afterwards people were having a huge reduction in pain of over 50%. Um, this is a study with 49 patients, and after two years, the pain score went from eight, you know, people circling on average 8.6, and people circling eights and nines, and now circling twos and threes. So profound, profound improvement in pain, and to all of you guys out there in chronic pain, just imagine your pain going down by 70%. So going into my office and circling eights and nines every time you see me, and now all of a sudden coming in circling twos and threes. So what's next? Um, talk to me about any of these if it's interesting to you, and if you think you meet criteria, or if you think that it would benefit you. And I will, for one, serve as your consultant and tell you if it is the right, if I think it's the right thing for you. Uh, and also make sure that you don't have anything potentially dangerous in your spine that would not allow you to have this kind of uh, therapy. And by dangerous, I just mean something that's going to keep it from going in, something that would block it from going in. These, all these procedures I just mentioned are extremely safe with a very, 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 very low complication rate and in good hands and with good technique, um, with image guidance, you're not going to that there's a very, very low, low probability of having any adverse reactions or adverse effect. All these procedures have a very, very high upside with very little downside. What I mean by that is the probability of it helping you and leading to a very substantial reduction in pain is greater than the probability of it leaving you with worse pain than before. And I, I can't think of any patients I've done any of these procedures on that are currently worse than they were before, 
Sometimes I will say people heal a little bit slower and it takes a little bit longer to heal from the surgery, but ultimately after you've given it, for the Vertiflex, after you've given it literally a few weeks, it should be better than you were before. Like 90% of patients out there are experiencing. And the same goes with spinal cord stimulation. When we implant the battery, um, which is, resembles like a pacemaker like you saw in the previous slide, there can be some soreness in the low back and gluteal area, especially where we put the battery. But that, after a matter of weeks, your body will form a good amount of scar tissue and healing around it in order to uh, take away that sensitivity and you will not feel it there forever. You, most of my patients with these uh, devices don't even feel them anymore, can't even tell they're there. And the majority of my patients, um, and we'll, we'll get to, um, looks like two of my patients that are online right now to tell about their experience, will tell you the same. Um, a lot of them had a lot of questions for me at the beginning. Is this gonna work for me? How long is this gonna work for? What are the dangers of doing these therapies? Um, I'm completely transparent with everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shoot you straight. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything when it comes to any of these therapies with any of my patients. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the uh, mic on to uh, either Mr. Burns or Mr. K or back to Amy um, to introduce them. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. Um, so everyone, I know that was a lot of information, um, but we're really lucky. We have two people on this call. Um, one has a spinal cord stimulator and one has a vertiflex. And so first we're going to hear from the patient that has a spinal cord stimulator to talk a little bit about his story. So I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Burns. Hey guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Burns. Uh, I'm going to talk about the spinal cord stimulator. I've had, uh, it was, October 2017 is when it went was implanted. Um, had a little rough start, but uh, it's been a, a real, I think, a real plus. Um, I quit taking opioids immediately, and uh, that was that was a, a real positive situation. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the overall maintenance has been very easy. So I'm a proponent. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, it's always good to hear a good story. The next patient that we have on here is actually a patient that has a vertiflex procedure and I'm going to pass it over to him, Mr. K. Okay. Mr. K, I think you're 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 not unmuted. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it says it says mute, so I click. Oh yeah, don't click mute. You're good. Okay, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize. I have a, <clears throat> have a frog in my throat. All of a sudden. Uh, I should start by saying that I'm a long-term walker. I've walked many, many, many miles. It's my favorite exercise. And uh, about, oh, well, I've, I've had increasing sensitivity in my back for, you know, a good many years. And about four years ago, it got bad enough that uh, I couldn't stand up for more than maybe 10 minutes without having to sit down. And if I... Um, uh, I couldn't walk very long because at, at first it made me lean forward as Dr. Gutierrez described and only doing that would ease it and then eventually it made me lean to one side and I could only walk. I'd been used to walking a couple of miles a day at least and I was down to trying to get in uh, a quarter of a mile or less and I could only do that with a cane. Uh, and I was leaning to one side. And the reason why I had to have a cane is to, is to keep me straight up, straight enough up and down, I wouldn't fall. So uh, my primary care doctor said, I'm going to send you to a really good pain guy. 
and he sent me to Dr. Gutierrez. Well, I had already tried uh, NSA IDs. I'd tried a TENS device, which helped some. I'd tried lidocaine patches, but none of them lasted very long. I'd had a, uh, a bad hip and had to have hip surgery five years ago. And I had been on uh, opioids, an opioid before that. And I told, I had told my primary care physician, I told Dr. Gutierrez, I'm not doing that again, period. And so he said, well, he went through all the questions and that he described in his comments earlier. And he uh, told me that um, he thought I was a good candidate for the radio frequency ablation. Well, we tried that twice. Uh, both times, it, in my case, it was not successful. It, it lasted a couple of weeks and then it would be back. And he explained to me, Medicare is not going to pay for that. If it doesn't last longer than that, I think maybe you're a candidate for the Vertiflex procedure. So he described it to me in much the way he's described it tonight. Uh, and being a, a naturally curious person, I went home and got into Google and looked up everything I could find out about it, including uh, uh, viewing an operation and viewing a, uh, a training film for, for people learning the procedure. And I decided this looked like a pretty good bet. It made sense to me. And one of the things I liked about it, well, I liked the fact he'd already gone through uh, a less invasive procedure first and tried that. And I liked the fact that if you did this one and for whatever reason it didn't work, it didn't preclude you doing more traditional back therapy, I mean, back surgery if you needed it. You know, you could still do that. And that was important to me. Uh, so uh, about the time we were ready to do it, the pandemic arrived. And so we had to put it off. And then when I finally got around to doing it, did the procedure, they got me back out of the operating room into the prep room. And I got up and got dressed and I could stand straight up and <laughs> straight up and down. I wasn't leaning to one side or leaning to the front. So I went home. Next morning when I got up, it was the same thing. I mean, it was like I had never had any back problem in terms of my ability to stand up straight or to walk. I could walk easily. And uh, the, uh, the back pain was completely gone. Uh, I was sore for three or four days, maybe. I don't remember how long, not very, not very long. And I started trying to walk. Well, by the time I went to see him at two weeks, I was walking, oh, half a mile, three quarters of a mile today, a day uh, in two, two sessions. By the time I went back at, at six weeks when he released me, I was walking at least two miles every day in two, in two sessions, uh, you know, a mile at a time. Uh, it, um, it absolutely changed my life. Uh, it took a while to build up the stamina uh, again and I still have a little bit of weakness in my back. I'm working on that with physical therapy, but I'll tell you what, it changed my life. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. K, for hopping on and sharing that. That's, a, that's an incredible story. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to hop on the call. Um, so now before we get to our Q&A, we're going to have a quick poll. So you're gonna see two quick questions pop up on your screen. If you could just go ahead and answer those quickly and then we will get to our Q&A with Dr. Gutierrez. All right, uh, look, sounds like I have a pretty unstable uh, internet signal. I keep getting an error message. So I hope I'm coming through to you guys at home and I hope that I'm not too choppy or um, robotic sounding. I can hear you pretty good on my end. Okay. Um, so as that poll's going, I'm going to go ahead and start with the Q&A. Um, so some of the questions that are coming over, we have one that says... I'm mute my... So the first question is, I have a spinal cord stimulator. Am I a candidate for a VertiFlex still? Oh, can you pull it away? I'm having problems with my speakers and I'm, I'm using um, somebody's phone here to, uh, to hear the question. What was the question? 
Um, feedback. Okay, it went away. <laughs> We're good. Um, so the question is, I have a spinal cord stimulator. Am I a candidate for VertiFlex still? Yes. So it depends on if you have spinal stenosis. And most people's spinal cord stimulators are entering high up in the spine. Um, one thing to remember, and I tell all my patients spinal cord stimulators this, is your spinal cord and where it's placed is actually much higher than where on your back it hurts. The vertiflex goes more into where it hurts exactly. So most people with spinal cord stimulators will have their leads and their anchors and all their, their, their stuff up around T12, L1, and their stenosis, the vertiflex is for, is more indicated for a problem down at like L4-5, like down in the lower part of the spine. So all that spinal cord stimulator stuff is out of the way. Um, so you can still have the vertiflex, um, obviously given if you have uh, a diagnosis that meets criteria for, uh, for spinal cord, uh, sorry, for spinal stenosis. So um, to answer the question, yes, but it depends on what the underlying problem is. Okay. Awesome. Um, the next question is, how does the vertiflex stay in place? Can it shift over time? Did you hear my question? So the question so, is, how does the vertiflex stay in place? Can it shift over time? You can turn it off. Okay, yeah, I can hear you guys now through my own computer. So I'm gonna stop using that other cell phone because it keeps feeding back and giving interference. So it stays in place with the own body weight and gravity um, holding it in place. Um, also scar tissue forms behind it, which helps also hold it and kind of tether it in place. Um, and, uh, but we fit it pretty exactly to the space between the bones at that level. We have a measuring tool that we use through the straw or the tube that I deploy uh, to measure the exact um, distance between the bones down to the millimeters. And uh, we will size it accordingly to um, exactly that distance that we measured. And so it, it's a pretty snug fit uh, to begin with because of how exact it is. But then also with your standing up and your own body weight, it holds it in place and also um, the, uh, uh, the scar tissue that forms behind it. I've had one of the many, many that I've done uh, uh, shift and slide out of place. That was a person who um, fell um, literally about I think a week after placing it, slipped and fell and landed on his back. And it did slip out a little bit um, because of that fall. But uh, that's, that's only one, um, and on most patients it stays in place, especially if you don't have a fall. Uh, also, yeah, we're, we are uh, sizing it a little bit more exact to, this, to the exact space than I think this was being sized originally when this device first came out, you know, five, four or five years ago. So um, they're staying in place a lot better now because um, the technique has also changed in terms of where on that bony space, it actually ends up. Um, we were, we're pushing a little bit deeper into the back now, so it fits more snug now than it used to. Awesome. Um, so the next question, if you can get only low back and leg pain relief from lying on your side, is the VertiFlex procedure still an effective treatment? Did you hear me? Probably not. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay though. Probably not. That to me sounds more like neuropathic pain. Now it's very hard for me to make an assessment over this um, webinar, um, seeing you in person and talking more specifics about what you just said would um, probably answer your question a little bit better. Um, but it sounds to me just by listening to that small you know, fraction of your overall pain experience that it's um, more likely neuropathic pain um, than mechanical pain if you 
uh, don't get relief standing or sitting down from standing or hunching forward from standing. Um, if you have to lay on your back and you have to get in a very specific position, that's pretty um, hard to do. Um, and I think that's, that's it's, it's pretty hard for you to get out of pain. And so if you're more in constant pain, not just when you're active, not just when you're up and walking, um, it's more likely to be a neuropathic pain process in my opinion. And um, something I push more towards the spinal cord stimulator if it is um, a condition of, um, it proves to be a condition of the spine or a condition of the nerves. Uh, again, without seeing and hearing the entire pain experience, the entire pain story, it's hard for me to just make an assessment over this video. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's another one on here. How long does a spinal cord stimulator last? Good question. Um, they last, I think, anywhere. But I mean, it also has to do with the new batteries coming out being a little bit more long lasting. Um, there are batteries that you never have to charge, and those will last three to four years without ever having to charge. Most of my patients get a rechargeable battery, and the recharging is easy and wireless, but those batteries last a lot longer. Those batteries will last anywhere between eight to 10 years, sometimes longer. Um, some of, a lot of the batteries I placed when I first got to Austin six years ago, still going strong and have no signs of failing um, or going dead. So um, I would say, and this is what um, we are told as doctors um, by the companies is uh, seven to 10 years, um, but it also depends not, without getting too lost in the weeds, it depends on how your settings are. If you use a lot of energy through it in order to get relief or very little energy to get relief. If you use a lot of energy, I would say maybe you're closer to seven years than 10 years. And if you use, you use very low energy settings, you're probably more looking at a 10 year lifespan of the batteries. Um, and I, I will mention also, what if technology changes in those 10 years? What if they get better over the next 10 years? Am I stuck with this old battery? The answer is no, um, and the answer is no, especially with Boston Scientific, because they are able to reprogram and upgrade your battery with the newest, latest technology, if it's in the newest generation of, of batteries and or uh, pulse generators. If it, you're in kind of the new era or, or, or their, their most up-to-date line, um, this is all upgradable technology and you just have to meet with a representative from the company to get upgraded to the newer therapy that's now available uh, through uh, the Boston Scientific platform. Great, um, we will do two more just so we can stay respective of everyone's time. So another one is, if I have a spinal cord stimulator, can I still get a vertiflex? I think we just answered that one. Um, that was the first question I thought we had. Maybe it was a repeat. The next question is, um, can I get an MRI with a spinal cord stimulator? Yes, um, so the answer, if you weren't listening to the first one, yes, you can have a, a vertiflex and a spinal cord stimulator. There's no problem because they go in different parts of the back most often. Uh, MRIs, yes. So um, Boston Scientific does have a fully MRI compatible system. Uh, the, everything uh, from the battery to the wires to the little anchors that hold the leads in place, everything is MRI compatible. Um, you just have to show the card to the radiologist or the technician at ARA or wherever you go get imaging um, and show them that card to show them that it is MRI compatible because they do have to change still some settings on the MRI machine to make sure it doesn't mess with the system. It will not you know, pull it out of your body like, with, like, like a strong magnet would or anything like that, but it can change the programs a little bit. Um, it can also change the, the battery life of it. Um, so they do have to change some settings on the MRI machine before you get in it, and you do have to um, turn it off before you go in. Awesome. So there are a couple more, but we will be able to follow up with you guys in the next couple of days just to answer some more of those. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so on the screen now, you see a number four pain specialist of Austin. If you are interested in a spinal cord. Why don't we take like two more? Okay. 
Let's see. Let me pull them back up. We'll be respectful. If, if, if anybody wants to log off, um, that's fine. Um, I'm here for you guys. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll do two more questions before um, before we log off. I want to be respectful okay. of everyone else's time. You know how I am. I'm here for you guys. I'm here for every for, for the patient. So let's, let's just do two two more. I think okay. that's reasonable. Um, I had a nevro trial. Can I still do a trial with Boston Scientific? Absolutely. Um, I do that all the time. Sometimes it just takes a conversation with the insurance company, let them know why. Um, and with a with conversation I can have with one of the doctors that works with the insurance company, uh, so these phone calls are called peer to peers. Um, I can explain to them that it was a failed nevro trial. Um, sometimes even a failed nervo implant. Um, but we're going to try a uh, product that has a lot more versatility, a lot more treatment options, and a lot more, uh, like I said, programs or modes that we can use um, that nevro, unfortunately, cannot. I'm not, here, not here to talk bad about nevro, but the Boston Scientific one does offer the combination therapy that we talked about earlier. And that one um, is, is, is the only thing. Boston is the only one that can provide um, combination therapies. So typically conversation with um, the insurance company, um, they'll agree to a repeat trial if they deem it medically necessary, um, which uh, is very easy to explain in this circumstance because uh, especially if you have a syndrome that's very commonly treatable with spinal cord stimulation, you just didn't respond to one mode, we can try a system that's got multiple modes. All right, and then one more. How long does a Vertiflex implant last? Does it ever have to be taken out? It does not ever have to be taken out. It can be in for life. It's uh, durable surgical uh, titanium and uh, it does not have to ever come out. All right. Well, um, so that's kind of it with all of our questions. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, for answering those. I really appreciate it. On the screen, you're going to see a number for PSA. If you're interested in either of these procedures, you can call the number and schedule a consult with Dr. Gutierrez. Um, the number, if you are on a cell phone and you can't see the screen, the number is 855-876-7246. And um, they're actually going to stay open until 8.30 Central Time if you want to schedule a consult tonight. We will also be following up with you guys in the next couple days to answer any questions you might have or give you inf more information on the procedures. Um, but thank you again, Dr. Gutierrez, for your time after a busy day in clinic. And then thank you for everyone that jumped on the call. We really appreciate it. And I hope you all found it beneficial. Uh, so we will be following up with you and we look forward to hearing from you guys soon. Thank you, everyone. Of course. Thank you for having me. And uh, again, if, uh, if my schedule is pretty packed, as you guys all know, it always is when you guys call for appointments. And I apologize for that. Um, if my schedule is full and it's, they cannot get you in soon enough for your consultation and discussion of any of these therapies that you're interested in, I encourage you to make an appointment with Casey Frederick. I know she's um, not me, but uh, she's been working with me for a very long time. And uh, she really has a very good understanding of these therapies just by way of working with me for so long. She can answer any of your questions. She can pass on to me any questions that she can answer. And she can also um, set up uh, a discussion with me if needed before moving forward uh, with any of these options. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez.